there is a meeting in Foxtown. And for our Zoom members, um, all of you, wherever you are, <laughs> we're happy you can join us. Please remember to mute yourself and submit any questions, comments via chat or unmute yourself and let us hear from you. And if all else fails, not once for uh, yes and twice for no. <laughs> the prayer and pledge today will be given by President-elect Charlie Cooper. Vice President Richard, each of you would bow your heads. As Rotarians, we are committed to seeking a world at peace. It is at times like this, with a senseless war being fought in the Ukraine, that we must redouble our efforts to find peace in the world. Give us the means to battle this war with kindness and to ease the suffering of those who are suffering. Watch over and protect them. Bless the hands of those who prepared today's meal and guide us in all that we do. Amen. Amen. Would you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Go ahead with my Yes, absolutely. Before I give up the podium, I would like to uh, play a short video on your tables. There's some information about a rotary license plate, and this video will explain it all much better than I can. Hey, welcome to Rotarians. I have a great detailed opportunity for you today. Rotarians are leaders, and it is important to let those who follow us know who we are. As we drive our vehicles, we now have a wonderful opportunity to let people know they are following a caring individual invested in making our community better. We have that opportunity by purchasing for a very small fee a special Rotanian license plate emblazoned with Bondar Rotary and the Rotary Emblem. And the purchase of the plate has an added benefit as a proportion of your payment will go to youth programs throughout our state and also to California. A wonderful facility providing holidays for special needs groups. We need you to act now. The Florida Rotary plate will become a reality after the first 3,000 people sign up. Having reached that total, the plates will be produced and you will be able to collect your purchase at your next plate renewal. And yes, you can also apply for a vanity plate with up to five levels. Sorry, two FNGR is already taken. <laughs> so please act now and book your plate by going to our special website listed here and click the repurchase tab. Please make that commitment to come forward to youth programs in your community and to show your support for those we can afford. Step up to the plate, get the plate, help youth programs, and show your rosary pride. A lot of work has gone into this program to get 3,000 people registered or pre registered for this plane. And the deadline is early this fall. And we are a long way away as, as a state in getting the number of people signed up. Understand, registering for the, for the plate, if Rotary is not successful in selling the 3,000 plates, you will be able to apply your, your application fee to your next renewal. So, so what's it cost? It costs $33, I believe. That's, that's, it. that's the basic end. <laughs> Yeah, to get a rotary plate. So there's information on each uh, table. I'm going to encourage and challenge everybody to sign up for at least one rotary plate. And if we don't get it by fall, can we go at it again? No. no. Yeah. Is there a way to keep track of how many commitments so we know where we are between now and the deadline is? Well, statewide, the people who are organizing it statewide, they, they get periodic updates okay. and I'm trying to remember it. So we can pressure people. There, yeah. So there's, oh, you mean within the club? Yeah. No, I'm going to figure that out. Okay, do that. Yeah. But I'm going to keep bugging you until I 
get a feeling that we've got 90% plus signed up. So it's, a, it's a good thing. It looks great on your car. Yes, Pat. Well, I'm wondering if we, uh, Leslie, if we move this, are we going to have any type of papers today on the screen? Because if we can, scooch it back just a little bit here, Jesse, we'll be able to see. Not that, you know, I'll see. Except for Leslie, we'll be able to see it now. Uh, we, 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 we're, we're just getting back all right. this way. Yeah, I can see. All right. All right. Okay. Here we go. Okay.
year, I was in a bigger firm, a national firm that had an office in Jacksonville, and that was a great experience. And then about three years ago, I moved to a more local Jacksonville firm, and that's been a really great fit for my practice. It really allowed me to focus more on Jacksonville clients, and Jacksonville folks that I know, and I've been able to help people I know. It's been very rewarding. So I think I'm uh, wrapped up. I appreciate your time and listening to me. And hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thank you. So um, quick question. So can you clarify what kind of trouble Dean has gotten into? Or is that a Not Dean specifically. Uh, uh, Not Dean specifically. <laughs> and plus, that would be attorney-client for <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. So now I know why the words I forgot are written on my badge. Anyway, sorry about that. And thanks for uh, coming through today. Fundraiser announcement? Sure. Welcome, Lisa Marie. Things are going well with the, uh, with the planning and execution for Casino Royale. Um, as mentioned previously, uh, we have got a slate of great things on the docket for our fundraiser with some casino games. We have a silent and live auction being lined up. We have our bar, our open bar, and some great food. And I believe there may be some live music down the way. Um, so again, ticket sales this week open up to other clubs as well as the community. So if you haven't purchased your tickets, of course, we want to give our club members first right, if you will. Um, we are limited on our seating to only 175 individuals. So if you haven't purchased your tickets or you'd like Patty to make sure that they get put onto your account, um, you can do that. Patty will be happy to take your ticket registration. And um, we're very excited about the upcoming event. Absolutely. May 007. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. Oh, no. I'd like to remind you that the district conference and training assembly is April 29th and 30th. I believe it's right here in town at the Hyatt. And I have a big long announcement here about rotary donations that are going to Ukraine via the York Foundation and Rotary Foundation Disaster Relief Fund. And that is probably as long as that announcement needs to be, except to say that the money that you are donating is being applied to the disaster in Ukraine right now. Uh, do we have a Paul Harris moment from Bill Trayer? Bill. So, for those of you that haven't been haven't been here or weren't paying attention to me, fell asleep at the last presentation. <laughs> quick review: We went to Paul's younger life. He was a rep skill in, played a lot of practical jokes. He winds up at the University of Vermont, where he's kicked out for um, rolling a cannonball down a hill and breaking a cow's leg, which in police terms is a, it's a 1066 now, cannonball <laughs> cow leg. Um, he then uh, he uh, was accepted at Princeton, um, even after that. And so we left off, he's a student at Princeton. He, at this point, his grandfather, who had been raising him, had been kind of the guiding guy in his life, passes away. His grandfather um, was a stubborn man, and he would go out mid-80s and shovel snow. And I don't know how many of you guys have shoveled snow. That is, it's a heck of an activity. He was determined he would continue doing it in front of his house, and he dies of a heart attack. So he just loses interest in college, um, and he moves to Iowa where he decides he wants to be a lawyer, of all things. Um, must have been a billboard that inspired him. So he uh, uh, is accepted into the University of Iowa School of Law. And that's where we pick up today. Um, after attending class at the University of Iowa for roughly nine months, um, 
from September of 1890 to June of 1891, Paul completed the normally two years of study and was deemed by the faculty to receive a degree. That's pretty handy. Only nine months you got to the law school back then. The rapid preparation uh, is indicative of how serious he was about um, his transformation from being a jokester to being a serious guy. Um, and at the at the um, graduation in 1876, uh, this a lawyer gave the talk. His subject: Our relationships with humanity. Uh, and he began the speech by saying, the newspapers and stage have portrayed the lawyer as a crafty and unscrupulous man. And the general, imagine that, and the general concept of the lawyer is not to be wondered at, but he continued, the promise of the law is to act as a balance we wheel between the rich and the humble. I thought it was actually pretty good. Um, so he has now, um, is about to graduate and but there's one more point that happens here. Um, and it's actually, it may have happened to him. As an academic requirement, each law candidate was required to write a paper on a topic chosen by the faculty. Only certain dissertations were found acceptable. All of the students were given an okay on it um, and everybody was able to uh, graduate. Sadly, someone on the panel decided to play a joke by recalling selected students for additional questioning regarding their quote, moral character. It is not known which members of the class were called for this, but uh, the whole thing was exposed and even the local paper, the, the Iowa Citizen, had to write an article about it, chastising the committee and asking what impression is left upon the young men. Um, and Paul notes that at the commencement speaker speaking, um, Adam Hudson stated it might be a wise plan for each graduate to take five years and make a fool of himself before settling down to practice law. I'm not even going to go any farther on that. So next week, we're going to go into the five years of folly of Paul Harris. All right, here we go. Uh, to introduce visitors and guests this afternoon as President Barry Covington. Thank you for thunderous applause. Nice to be right here. Ryan, those were good comments you made uh, about the legal profession. Unfortunately, it reminded me of some things that went on in my past, things that you never expect to happen. And you say, and that's when you say, thank God there's lawyers out there to attempt to rescue you. But having said all of that, we do have some guests. Uh, Jason Burnett, where are you? You have a guest. Oh, I do. <laughs> This is just a reminder. I'm wondering about, do I, you know, I am a lawyer. So a lot of lawyers are, but uh, with me again is Michael Hoodling. Uh, he's becoming so off, he's probably going to introduce me next time. So uh, we're going to uh, uh, make an effort to uh, get to know Michael. He's a, uh, an appraiser here in town. And I see Bill Langley's name here under guest to begin with. And then arrows are drawn. And then there's another arrow that goes. Can Katie introduce that? Yeah, yeah, Katie can introduce me this time. I don't have to look. Yeah, yeah. I like to introduce in, again Katie Bowling. She's the manager and development coordinator for the Jacksonville Children's Choir. Thank you. Of course. We got anybody zooming today? We do not. No Lynn. zooming. One bit. Say hello. Hi, Lynn. Hello, Lynn. Lynn, are you there? I'm sure she, she's working hard, right? She's all well, sure. <laughs> there she is. She's like, what's, what's for lunch? Um, oh, yes. <laughs> My God, how can I forget this?
promise this will be short. Uh -oh. <laughs> promise, promise. Just to set the record straight, the origin of that song came with a Rotarian, a Rotarian in this club who moved here from, I think, the Midwest. His name was Sam Rosenthal. And we got to call him singing Sam Rosenthal because he introduced the song and said, this is great. You've got to do this. This was, I guess, in the early 70s. And so lots of people look at it kind of askance, you might say. But we did it. And at one point, somebody wanted to try to kill the thing. But it's too late. It's a grain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and our program introduction this afternoon is courtesy of past president Arlen Post. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker. You, uh, you must say selling. How to do? <laughs> Close you, enough. You must say selling has been the president of the Florida Theater since 2012, which is now re recognized as one of the top five most attended theaters in the country with up to 2,000 seats. Wow. He's a native of New York. He moved to Jacksonville from Red Bank, New Jersey where he was the CEO of the historic Count Basie Theater from 2002 to 2012. He's a graduate of the Fredonia School of Music. He received his MBA from Adelphi University, and he's a postgraduate certificate in nonprofit management from Springfield College. Folks, the Florida Theater is a great venue, man. Uh, my wife Patty and I are friends of the theater. If you're not involved, I, I hope you will. There's a new campaign for uh, some improvements at the theater, and your your assistance will certainly be needed. That said, come on up, man. Good morning. Uh, great to see you all. Uh, um, I, I was so pleased to walk in. Uh, and see Martha Barrett, who just had to leave. Um, but uh, Martha was present at my very, very first Rotary speech in Jacksonville. Uh, the first club I talked to was the Downtown Club in the fall of 2012, shortly after I got here. And Martha was there. And uh, someone in the audience asked me uh, about uh, how the Florida theater got saved and uh, Jake Godbold, who was mayor at the time, played a big part in that. And uh, I had been told uh, numerous times that uh, Jake would sneak out of City Hall, which at the time was right around the corner from the theater. He would sneak out of City Hall at lunchtime and go over to the Florida theater with a tuna fish sandwich and sneak into the balcony and watch karate movies. <laughs> and Martha was his assistant at the time and would often go with him and started whispering in his ear, you know, it would be a great thing for the city if we saved this old theater, turned it into a performing arts center, and that'll be an economic driver for downtown. And uh, I said to the crowd, you know, anytime you can get a politician's name and karate movie in the same sentence, that's a win. I had no idea that Martha was in the audience. Uh, and then she stood up and gave me her version of these events. Um, so I was really happy to see Martha here this morning when I walked in. Um, the Florida Theater is a great venue. Uh, I, it, it's not due to anything I do. Um, you know, I stand on the shoulders of everybody who came before me. Uh, if you don't know the history of the theater, it was originally built in 1927. When the Florida Theater opened in April of 1927, there were five other theaters on Forsyth Street already. In the four blocks from Newton to Hogan Street, there were five other theaters on Forsyth Street already. Florida Theater is the only one that survived. And if you think about that for a second, how different downtown would look if just one or two of those other buildings had survived. Um, we're still super lucky that the Florida Theater did survive, but downtown might look very different if we had a little theater row there. Um, but still, the people who got behind the preservation of the Florida Theater 
uh, had a great deal of foresight because in the late 1970s, it was not yet a thing. There are isolated incidents around the country uh, of people who have the same idea that Martha and Jake had that, you know, let's save the old theater, let's turn it into a performing arts center, it'll bring people <coughs> downtown and that'll generate activity. But there wasn't yet a movement. So uh, Jake Godwald and Martha Barrett and a guy named Bill Nash, who was president of Prudential at the time, and uh, uh, Trinidad Alogue, who was director of what was then the Arts Assembly, which is now the Cultural Council, and uh, Jeff Dunn, uh, who is still here in town and was chairman of the Arts Council. Those five people spearheaded a movement to buy the theater from its original owners, rehab it, and open it as a nonprofit mm -hmm. arts center. That happened in 1983. Uh, the Arts Council operated the building for three years until, uh, four years until 1987. Uh, they ran up a lot of debt doing it. And uh, to get out from underneath the debt, they sold the, uh, the building to the city. They used that money to pay off their debt. The city did a super smart thing at that very moment. They established another nonprofit corporation dedicated to the preservation and the programming and the operation of the building. And that's who I work for. So since 1987, Florida Theater Performing Arts Center Incorporated has managed and programmed the theater. I've been here since 2012. I replaced the founding director. Uh, we've had a significant period of growth over the last several years. Uh, uh, as you heard a moment ago, uh, Florida Theater is one of the top 100 most attended theaters in the country. Um, there are two professional journals that track those statistics, and both of them agree that we're one of the top 100 most attended buildings in the country. We're in a crazy category with like Radio City Music Hall, which has 6,000 seats, and the Fox Theater in Atlanta, which has 4,500 seats, and the Auditorio Nacional in Mexico City, which has 10,000 seats. So if you parse the numbers a little bit and look at venues under 5,000 seats, excuse me, 2,000 seats, we're just below that number. If you look at venues under 2,000 seats, we are always, every year, top five. So, and I tell people that, and they're surprised that that's in Jacksonville. But I am here to tell you, Jacksonville likes to go out and have a good time. Um, if you think across uh, uh, the full spectrum of entertainment in downtown Jacksonville, the Jags, the Shrimp, the Icemen, concerts at the arena, uh, the symphony, the artist series, uh, Florida theater, and a, you know several other dozen things I'm not even thinking of. Uh, that's a lot of people coming into downtown. That's a lot of people coming into downtown from other places in Duval County and from outside the area as well. Um, we serve uh, uh, about 175,000 people a year. 49% uh, of them, so basically half, are from Duval County. Another 20% are from the rest of the five county first coast area. And the rest of them are from everywhere. 9% uh, is from elsewhere in Florida, and the rest are from anywhere in the US or international. Uh, so, you know, think about that. Half of our audience every year is from outside Duval County. And they come here and they spend their money in downtown Jacksonville, uh, which I think, in addition to enhancing the quality of life, is one of the most important things about the Florida theater. Uh, and this is why you should care about the Florida theater, even if you've never been there, because it's an economic driver. In an average 12 month cycle, uh, we create a $14 million economic impact for the city of Jacksonville and Duval County. <clears throat> we support the full time equivalent of over 400 jobs and $10 million household income and about a million and a half of state taxes and city taxes and fees. Um, our city tax num our city fee number, it's about $550,000. Uh, we receive a competitive grant from the city via the Cultural Council of Jacksonville of about $260,000 a year. So think of it this way. We get about $260,000 in support from the city, and we return that every year in the form of $550,000 of fees and ta sales tax revenue. We double the city's money every year. I wish my retirement portfolio did that well because I wouldn't be here talking to you this morning. Uh, all, uh, you know, every time we're open, uh, we create jobs for our bartenders, our box office workers, our security workers, our stagehands, all the people whose jobs depend on us having an event that night. 
but we also create work for people who don't even work for us. So every night we're open, the parking lot attendants in downtown have another night of work. The bartenders and waitresses have another busier night of work. Uh, every month we're open, uh, the air conditioning company that maintains our air conditioners has another maintenance stop that month. And all that adds up to about 400 jobs and $10 million of household income, uh, all from an arts organization. So every time you go out and enjoy a show, uh, not only are you supporting your own right to have a good time, but you're also supporting a bunch of jobs, uh, which I think is just great. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we manage a program, the building, uh, which means that we are responsible for the preservation of the building as well as what goes on the stage. Uh, people ask me frequently, you know, how things wind up on our stage. Uh, and, you know, some of those events are theater rentals, just someone knocking on our door to say, hey, I, I have a, a dance recital or an award show or a benefit concert that we want to do and we want to rent the theater from you. Uh, that's about 50 shows a year. Uh, about another 125 to 150 nights a year are things that we invest our own money in. So Florida Theater is an active investor in its own programming. I think lots of people think that, uh, you know, uh, these things kind of happen by random, like Dave Chappelle wakes up in Ohio somewhere in the morning and says, let's go to Jacksonville Saturday night, find someone who will stand at the door and collect our money. Doesn't work that way. Um, uh, most things on our stage, we have spent a lot of money to make them come to Jacksonville. Uh, we guarantee that money. So they're getting paid no matter what happens. Uh, pretty much like any other job, no matter what happens today, the performer is getting paid. We also guarantee the salaries of all the people who support the show. We spend the advertising money and we hope we make our money back at ticket sales. Um, uh, we make money about 75, 70% of the time. We lose money about 30% of the time. Uh, our batting average is pretty good. Um, and that's kind of what you look for is a good batting average across a, a, a 12 month cycle. Um, 70, 30 is a really good year. And I love saying that because it sounds so stupid. Like I lose money 30% of the time and that's a good year. Um, uh, but you know, we, go out and spend money and make, you know, calculated risk decisions to spend money on an artist and get them to come here because we think people will want to see them and we think we stand a good job at getting our money back. Uh, a few times a year, we spend our profits on something which we know is going to lose money, but we think for some reason or another is important to do in Jacksonville. So it might be a modern dance company that uh, we know there's an audience for, but there's not enough of an audience for. Uh, might be an educational program. So 20 or 30 times a year, we have a program called Theater Works, and they put kids on big yellow school buses and bring 2,000 kids downtown in the morning to come and see a page-to-stage theatrical adaptation of one of their storybooks or their textbooks. Uh, and we underwrite that with some of our fundraising and some of our profits from a comedian or a classic rock concert. Uh, we make a really big attempt every year to have balanced programming. Um, I think when people start talking to me about what I do, they think I've got the coolest job because I just book my own record collection. Uh, and it doesn't work that way. In fact, uh, so there's a staff member who does book our shows. And I find when I'm excited about a show, we need to ask ourselves twice if there really are enough people who are going to come to it. <laughs> you know, we're not booking the, the theater for me. We're booking the theater for you and everybody else in the city. So if you look at our schedule at any given point in time, uh, I brought some postcards, which I forgot to put out, but they're on this table over here. If you look at our schedule at any given point in time, it looks like a crazy quilt of completely disconnected performances uh, with country music and classic rock and comedians and hip hop and ballet. But if you look at our performance schedule over the course of a year or two, you begin to see some common themes and you see clearly that we're attempting to serve all the constituencies in Duval County and the five county first coast area. We want everybody to have a reason to come to the Florida theater at least once a year and hopefully we bring them back. Uh, about half of our audience is uh, our repeat customers. Half of them have come to see the one show they care about and they're not coming back till they, you know, their, their God comes back again. Um, uh, but we love those repeat customers because they're what keep us going. Um, 
We are approaching our 100th anniversary. Florida Theater will be 100 in 2027, which is super exciting. Uh, just think about that for a second. Uh, and we're engaged in a, uh, an ongoing capital fundraising campaign to get the theater in shape for its next 100 years. Um, we started out with a five million, 10, uh, a five year, $10 million capital improvement plan. And as we've dug into things uh, and figured out where the new electrical panel is going to go and you know, how we're going to uh, replace the HVAC system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's grown into a multi year, $20 million project, um, which we're you know, almost halfway through. Um, uh, that was a big chunk to bite off when we first started down that road. Uh, our budget every year is about $10 million now, give or take. Uh, we make 65% of that at the box office. Uh, we make 20% of it from other business activities. So bar sales, merchandise sales, t-shirts. So every time you buy a t-shirt, every time you buy a beer, that's supporting the Florida theater as well. We fundraise the other 15% to balance our budget every year. Uh, I tell donors, I think that's a pretty good deal because, you know, if we're just raising 15%, uh, it's very obvious that we're not spending that on anything crazy or wasteful. It's just that little extra bit of rocket fuel to make us the special place that uh, we'd like to be. Um, but that leaves the building uh, as the albatross on our back. So we have to go out and raise all the extra money to uh, improve the building. Uh, City of Jacksonville uh, still owns the building, so they're in for half of the project so far. So on the initial $10 million, they made us a matching gift of $5 million. So every dollar we raised, uh, they've contributed a dollar. Uh, we're, uh, we will be through that match sometime uh, at the, towards the end of next fiscal year. Uh, and that'll be the $10 million mark, and that'll be the halfway mark. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, we were about a year from uh, actually doing the first project. Uh, we had our final performance on May 12th of 2020. We closed for what we thought was gonna be, you know, two weeks to stop the spread. Uh, if you told me that night what was about to happen, I would have said you were enjoying the bar a little too bit much. Um, I never in a million years would have imagined uh, that we would survive, not only survive, but be stronger uh, coming out the other end of the pandemic. Um, something I think is important to mention, uh, we received a lot of relief money from the city and the state and the federal government. And uh, I like to tell people this, government worked. Our government worked and did some of the things that they should do. Uh, they made it possible for us not to go bankrupt. They made it possible for us to preserve uh, our jobs during the pandemic. Uh, we all took salary cuts. Some of us took very steep salary cuts, but we survived and we came out the other end and now we're busier than ever. So, you know, our ability to drive the downtown economy and keep people employed is possible because we got some support. Um, and that time period, you may remember, crosses two presidential administrations. Uh, Members of both parties voted for that aid. So this is really a bipartisan success. And it's an example of how government can work for us and did. And I like to tell people that because all of our tax dollars, mine included, help make that possible. And I, I really think it's important for us to know that government can work. It doesn't work all the time, but it can if the right things happen. So uh, uh, we closed on March 12th. By the end of May, it was becoming really apparent to us that we weren't going to be open anytime soon. And we started wondering, you know, maybe we could use this downtime to jumpstart some of those projects. Uh, the first project was going to be replace our seats, which were almost 40 years old. Uh, I called the seat company out of the blue one day and said, well, you know, we know you won the bid, but the work is scheduled for a year from now. If I overnight you a check tomorrow, <laughs> could you start work tomorrow? And they said yes. Uh, so uh, we just kind of uh, made a leap of faith and pressed the go button. We had the money in the bank. In the back of our minds was we might need that money to survive, even though donors gave us that money for a very specific purpose. Um, uh, we might need it, 
but let's just kind of assume everything's going to work out. Uh, and over the next several months, we took out all the old seats. We repaired 90 years of damage to the floor of the theater. Uh, we replaced all of the seats. We bought a brand new sound system to replace our 25 year old sound system. And when we reopened in December, we had new seats and a new sound system, uh, which was a great way to kind of make lemon, lemonade out of lemons. Uh, last year, uh, we replaced the theater's lighting system, which was also 25 years old. Um, lots of technology has happened in the last 25 years. So we've got a better sound system. We've got a better light system. That saves us money every night because we don't have to rent gear. Uh, this year's project is that we are building out a brand new donor lounge. So we found a way to join our second floor lobby to the uh, second floor of the office building that's part of our complex. It's the first expansion of our public space in almost 100 years. If you've been to the Florida theater, you know the lobby's super crowded on a busy night. So this allows us to spread people over a bigger area. It's a brand new 3,000 square foot bar. Um, and then next year, we close for four months from July to October. We replace the 40 plus year old air conditioning system. Then we repair all the paling plaster and paint, paint the place. Um, there's lots to come after that. Bathrooms, the marquee, uh, carpeting eventually. I mean, there's a long laundry list of projects. Uh, but you know, for the next two years, we've got like three CFA projects lined up. We have the money in the bank to do it, and we're going to get it done, which we're so excited about. Um, so by the time we get to 2027 and our 100 year anniversary, it's going to be a brand new, or at least a brand new looking old historic theater. Um, and you know, in the back of our mind is. We want the building to be preserved for the next hundred years. Uh, creating a new donor lounge and a new bar is all about how do we make ourselves more financially self-sufficient. Um, corporate money is not what it used to be. Government money is what it's not used to be. And we have to be realistic about that. So it's on us to make sure we fund ourselves uh, and continue to maintain that kind of 85, 15% fundraising earned income split. Um, uh, we have great shows coming. Uh, I'm going to make you an offer. Uh, uh, this Friday night, we have a band called the Lords of 52nd Street. They are the original members of Billy Joel's band. If you know Billy Joel's music, uh, these are the guys that recorded all of his major hits from roughly the mid 70s to the mid 80s across five albums. Uh, when you get past the fact that it's not Billy Joel singing, which takes about a song, they're amazing. And it's so much fun to sit there and like when they play New York State of Mind to think that's the guy that played the sax solo. That's actually the guy that played on the record. They're amazing. You are all invited to come as my guest. All you got to do is email me. Uh, my email address is my first name, N-U-M-A at floridatheater.com. Florida Theater is one word with an R-E. Um, we spell theater with an R-E because that's how you can tell we're fancy. <laughs> um, Numa at floridatheater.com. Friday night, eight o'clock, no opening act. They're amazing. You will have a good time. Trust me. Uh, floridatheater.com is our website. Uh, we sell our own tickets. So you should buy your tickets direct from us at floridatheater.com. Uh, we have no affiliation with Ticketmaster or StubHub or Vivid Seats or any of the other thousands. <laughs> Thousands of ticket scalper websites, floridatheater.com. It is very easy to go online and just Google the name of your art, favorite artist and see a Jacksonville show and to get tricked into buying from a scalper um, who may or may not be legit. We have people who come to the box office every night with completely fraudulent tickets that they have spent hundreds of dollars on. And we don't have their money uh, and they didn't buy a real ticket. So there's not a lot we can do to help them. So I emphasize floridatheater.com. If you're coming to the Florida Theater, go to floridatheater.com, buy your tickets there. Uh, uh, great shows coming. Uh, it is one of the busiest years we've ever had. Uh, they, uh, the people who've been around a long time talk about 1996-97 as the high water mark of events at the Florida Theater. We had 250 shows in a year. And that's because that was the year the old Civic Auditorium was closed 
to become what's now the Times Union Center. Uh, so all the events in downtown came to the Florida theater for a year or two. Uh, we are on track to come very close to that this year, which is crazy, um, but it's exciting as well. Uh, I also, uh, before we maybe have time for a question or two, uh, I wanna plug Jack's River Jams because I am also uh, a board member of Downtown Vision. Uh, Downtown Vision's the nonprofit that runs the Downtown Improvement District. We run Art Walk, we uh, manage the ambassadors. Um, and last year we created a brand new free concert series called uh, Rip Jack's River Jams. It's four Thursday nights in April. It's on the old landing site which is now called Riverfront Plaza, then everybody says, where's that? So I tell them it's the old Jacksonville Landing. Um, four Thursday nights, uh, April 7 is Spin Doctors and Sister Hazel. April 14 is Boys to Men. April 21 is Carly Pierce, who is the Academy of Country Music Female Vocalist of the Year this year. So that's a big deal. And uh, April 28 is Manchester Orchestra. I have no idea who they are, but the cool kids and the young kids all seem to think that's great. So uh, uh, last year we had attendance every night from 7,500 to 10,000 people. Uh, and I tell people, you know, all the naysayers about downtown, all you gotta do is come to one of these nights and see 10,000 people on the lawn, all having a good time for free. Um, and there is no doubt that you know, downtown Jacksonville is on the move and is gonna be you know, as successful as it could possibly be. So, uh, yes, sir. So I went to a show one time in Detroit and I realized they were facing some of the same stuff that I hear here. Oh, I never go downtown. Oh, downtown's dangerous. But they had a uniform person on every corner because it was Detroit. I mean, and you, you, you saw that all the time. What do we do in Jacksonville to start helping people realize it's good to go um, So a couple quick things. Uh, we survey our audience every year. And uh, there are three things we always expect to hear and make it us about. Cleanliness, crime, and parking. Our audience could not care less. <laughs> they, they all think that those things are not a problem. Um, and, you know, in fact, they're not. Uh, within a block of the Florida theater, there are 1,600 parking spaces. I, should, I have 1,864 1, seats. So there's clearly enough parking. Uh, the neighborhood looks a little grungy, uh, but it's not like you're going to the dump. And uh, crime downtown, uh, the downtown zone is one of the safest places in the city. The number one crime in downtown Jacksonville is cell phone theft. It's people who go to Starbucks and put their, or, you know, go meet after work to have a drink, put their phone on the bar and forget that it's there and someone steals it. Um, you know, downtown is one of the safest places in the city. It's just perception. Um, you know, honestly, uh, that concerns me. You know, I'm, our existing audience uh, is unbothered and happy to come. I, but I'm aware that there are many people who think, you know, downtown is Dodge City and they're afraid to come. And, and that's real. It's not true, but it's a real perception. And, you know, uh, I think it's just like, it's me going out to talk to you at Rotary Clubs all over the city to say, come on down town, try it. I'll give you tickets to a free, I'll give you free tickets. Come on, be my guest. Um, you know, uh, I know people, uh, we moved here from New Jersey. We have friends from Jersey who have a house in Ponte Vedra. Um, they've had the house for like 30 years. They're, you know, gradually making it the retirement home till we got here. They had never come downtown. They drove down 95, make a left, made a left and went right out to Ponte Vitra. They had never been downtown, hadn't come to a Jags game, hadn't gone to the symphony, hadn't come to the Florida theater. It just wasn't in their frame of reference. But now that they've been, they come more frequently. So just like any other retail business, like the hardest thing is to get the customer through the door for the first time. Once you've done that, they're more likely to come back. Yeah. What time do the doors open Friday? Seven o'clock. Doors at seven, concert at eight. Um, one thing you didn't mention in your list of improvements was any sort of television infrastructure. I don't recall seeing often any sort of televised events from the theater. So can you talk about that a little bit? Um, you mean like us broadcasting a show that you can watch at home? Yeah. So uh, interesting question, because during the pandemic, uh, a lot of organizations turned to streaming of performances as an alternative to live. Um, 
we found out our audience doesn't care. Um, uh, you know, we, we experimented with streaming a little bit and at best we sold 150 tickets to one event. Uh, usually we did worse than that, uh, which we interpret as a positive because it means that people value what we do, which is to congregate, you know, aggregate people in a room to enjoy a performance together live in person. The, the tricky piece about it, if we were to try to put something on TV is the artist, uh, because we don't control the performers that we book. Um, it's the strangest business. You know, you tell someone, I'm gonna give you a stupid amount of money for 90 minutes of work. And then over the like three or four month period that your contract covers, they tell you what to do. Uh, and generally speaking, they all like to control their image. Uh, so they have the right to say, we'll let's try something to record it or not. So Dave Chappelle, we mentioned, wanted to film his next HBO special. It couldn't come to the theater because that infrastructure doesn't exist. Um, well, we would bring cameras in to do something like that. Yeah, you know, we don't have that infrastructure in house. We would bring it in. Uh, some people have. So Leonard Skinner taped uh, two nights a few years ago, uh, which are in rotation on Access TV. I see it every now and then. Uh, Cat Williams taped the Netflix special uh, here a few years ago. Uh, if you've not seen it, you should go find it on Netflix because the first 20 minutes of his special are all about Jacksonville and it is utterly hilarious. Uh, he doesn't live here and I don't know how he knows as much about us as he does. Uh, um, uh, Larry Wilmore taped a, show, a Showtime special with us and NPR has broadcast a couple shows live. So it happens from time to time. It's just, it's not something we can control. Yeah. Somewhere in my past, okay. I heard <laughs> it was racist. It was it, it wasn't a joke. I can still recall. So, so, and I can still so recall in, in folklore that the Florida Theater was the first building in downtown Jacksonville to be air conditioned. Is that true? I don't know. I have not heard that. I can tell you it was. You were there, Barry? What was yes. <laughs> I did see Elvis in 1956. He will be able to do it in the, uh, <laughs> And if you missed if you missed the night at the Florida Historical Society where people talk about that, to he either been there or uh, Judge uh, what's his name? Goody, Goody, Judge Goody's daughter. It was great. It really was. Um, Took me back to my youth. I was very very young. Florida Theater is the first building in the Southeast built with ready mixed concrete. It's got a million bricks in it. They broke ground in June of 1926 and opened in April of 1927. Just think about that for a second, how fast that building went up and it's still standing. Do you know what was said in that lot before the Florida? City Jail. Yeah. Uh -huh. Police Department. Um, the, uh, when it, on opening night, the police chief was quoted as saying, uh, people used to pay to get out, now they pay to get in. <laughs> we have membership categories. We, we, very quickly we do have membership program. categories. Membership starts at $250 a year. Uh, it allows you access to our lounge and the ability to buy tickets before the general public. That's the big perk that most people like. Uh, it goes on up from there. Uh, and if you get to, I think it's the $2,500 a year uh, level, you get to pick your own seats and they're reserved for you at every show. Uh, so if you come to a lot of shows and we have several people who do, you get to pick those two seats and they're yours if you want them for every show. And considering we do 100 plus shows a year, that's a pretty good benefit. Um, just one comment about Judge Gooding. Um, so if you've never done it, Google Elvis Presley Florida Theater, uh, and you'll find the Life magazine coverage of Elvis's six concerts here in 1956. Um, uh, it's hilarious. It's just a time capsule from another era. Um, but Judge Gooding, uh, Elvis had been here a year earlier. He played at the Armory. There was lots of teenage hysteria. When he came back, Judge Gooding brought him to Chambers and told him there will be no hip swiveling. <laughs> and I will be there. I will be there with a warrant in my pocket. And, and we will arrest you. And by all accounts, Elvis stood stock still center stage, 
played six shows without moving. Scotty Moore, his band member, says that's the night he started sneering. And he spent, <laughs> he's that Elvis sneer. He spent the whole night looking at the back at Joe Gooding and sneering at him. But what I find fascinating is Judge Gooding let his kids come to the show. His kids came to the show. And I find that really interesting that while he was upholding public morals, he also kind of looked at his kids and said, well, you know, I know you want to go do what you got to do. I just, I just want to add something to that. That night at the Historical Society meeting when Judge Goody's daughter was recounting all of this, and she said, she said, my dad that night said, you know, that really is a nice young man. And he said, I didn't like Colonel Parker at all. She said, but Elvis was really a nice young man. Yes, ma'am. Um, as a new member of the Schrader Club and um, recently put on to the uh, committee for our big fundraiser, um, would you like to donate some tickets? For Absolutely. Our <laughs> Anyway, you're all involved in many charities. I know that. Um, I'm an on again, off again Rotarian myself. Um, We've had an opening. We, uh, <laughs> we, we give away about $25,000 worth of tickets a year to charity. All you got to do is email me. Tell me, uh, <laughs> tell me what and where, uh, you know, when, you're, when your event is and where it is, and we'll be happy to hook you up with something for your office. Awesome. Yes. Uh, you talk about it's you know it is a historical building so in all of your renovations are you have you have restrictions on things that you're replacing versus restoring or yeah we've tried uh so uh there depending what what it is and where it is uh there are <laughs> historical restrictions um but even when we're not restricted we have tried to you know, keep preservation of the building and keeping it historically accurate as kind of our guiding light. So, you know, even if we're not required to have, for example, the right, you know, tile in the bathroom, uh, we try to go out of our way to do it because that's what makes the building special. Um, anybody can put a tent up in a parking lot and call it a venue, but there's only one Florida theater. <laughs> Last question, because I think I'm getting the hook. You are. Well, Numa, thank you. It's awesome to have you here. I always love your energy. Um, and passion that you bring to, to the theater and what we can do to contribute to that. Correct me, rooftop, not structurally sound anymore because Florida Theater used to have a rooftop. Well, we, just to be technical, we do have a rooftop. Well, <laughs> <laughs> rooftop is in, in 1927, when the building opened, there was an open air roof garden uh, on the seventh floor. Um, it had a stage and they had big band dancing under the stars. Um, uh, it was open on the, I guess it's the south side and the east side. So when you were up there, you could see the river. Um, by the early 30s, they figured out they could make more money by putting a roof on it and turning it into more offices to rent out to lawyers. I'm sorry, guys, I know there's a lot of lawyer jokes today. But, uh, they realized they could make more money by turning it into real estate. So they put a roof over it and the roof garden went away by 1935. Um, you can still see, if you know where to look, you can walk around the seventh floor and see elements of uh, what once was. Uh, I get asked that question all the time. It captivates people's imagination. Uh, we have, we look at it on again, off again, as you know, could we restore this? Um, because people do ask about it all the time. Uh, it doesn't really affect our operations uh, at the moment, so it's kind of low on our priority list. Um, but who knows? It's just time and money. So one day we might and see <laughs> and a donor. Uh, so uh, we might yeah, see that again someday. Uh, thanks, everybody. It's been great. For your uh, talk and for your generosity, we uh, have made a donation to the Rotary Foundation and Polio Plus for the eradication of polio in your honor. And here is a document to prove it. Thank you. <laughs> Next week, our speaker will be Kevin Snyder, the Vice President of Duval Motor Company, and he will speak to us regarding the industry chip shortage. I'm glad that we'll know what the answer is. <laughs> As we end our meeting, we reiterate.
reiterate our membership motto, each one bring one, and join in our rotary motto, one profits most, two serves best.